Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, March the 2nd, 2022. It is currently 4.52 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And if you know your history, it's March the 2nd. So this is an important day. Even though I'm in the middle of nowhere, Texas, a celebration should be occurring because today is Texas Independence Day. If you know your history, and even if you don't know your history, well, you should at least, the only thing you should know in history is when Texas Independence Day is. The only thing you should know about history, period, is things that relate to the state of Texas. Everything else is really irrelevant. I mean, right? I mean, come on, can't we all agree on that? I mean, I know this is a theology podcast and we can't agree on anything theologically, but we should all agree that the only history that matters is Texas history. Okay, you obviously know I'm joking because <laughs> happy Independence Day. Yes, someone said happy Independence Day. Thank you. Yes, the only Independence Day that matters, that whole July 4th thing, I don't even understand why anyone would celebrate that. It's Texas Independence Day. I'm just joking. Obviously, I care about other history, like church history. We do a lot of studying of, of that here in this church and on this podcast. So um, we do care about history, but it is March the 2nd. And what I'm going to do, I, I got here early. Uh, we will be here at 7 p.m. tonight for the in-person service. So if you would like to listen to that, we'll be live streaming that as well. But between now and 7 p.m., well, between now and 6.45, 6.50, when people, who am I kidding? When people arrive at about 7.15, okay, so I will I will try to stop doing any live broadcast around 6.45, around 6.45, and then uh, be ready for people to arrive, and then we'll go live again sometime after 7. But I am here right now. So here is what I want to do, all right? I want to ask you a very important question. This is very important. This is very serious. I, all of the joking now, we're going to set that aside, just joking around because now we have to get deadly serious, right? Because this is a very important question. When it comes to salvation, who gets the credit? Who deserves all the credit for your salvation? Now, I know the initial reply by most will be, well, God deserves all the credit. God deserves all the praise. He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the credit. And many will say that. However, if you listen to them, maybe talk about their salvation or talk about salvation, sometimes you'll begin to see, wait a minute, wait a minute. It sounds like... You're taking some of the credit. It sounds like you're claiming that we can take some of the credit. And I don't think I don't think people sometimes realize this, but this is a very important theological concept. Look, there's basically two theologies when it comes to salvation. God deserves all the credit alone or God did his part and we do our part. Sometimes we would classify these different systems of theology as monergism versus synergism. Monergism basically being the work of one, synergism being the work of two. I'm oversimplifying it, but you get the basic idea. You're either monergistic or synergistic. If you're monergistic, you believe God. A salvation is completely the work of God alone. If you're synergistic, yes, you believe God did his part, but you believe you did something. You believe you played a part in it. And we, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could go through this. We could talk about Arminianism versus Calvinism. We could talk about Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism. But really, if we just set aside all of those theological terms, it really comes down again to a simple question. Who gets the credit? If you are saved today, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, who deserves credit? the credit. Now, the reason I'm asking this question is because today I had to go get a haircut and I got in the car and like I typically do, I grabbed, 
I either have my iPad. I usually have something with me so that I can listen to something. Now, sometimes I'll turn on the car radio and listen to Christian radio or maybe, you know, talk radio, just trying to keep up with what's going on in the world, what's going on within Christianity. But a lot of time I'll grab my phone and go to the Edify Christian podcast app or the Sermon Audio 2.0 app, which I've been, we've been talking a lot about. So today it was Sermon Audio 2.0. I just grabbed the app pulled down for the latest sermons and just hit play, boom, on the latest sermon. And I started driving and I didn't make it very far. I I, I didn't even arrive yet uh, to the place where I get my hair cut. I didn't even make it there, which is only maybe 13 minutes, maybe, maybe even less from my house. And, uh, but as I was driving, I started listening. I'm like, well, this is interesting. This person's talking a lot about salvation. But it sounds a little bit like, or at least this serves as an example of how someone can talk about salvation and it sounds like they are giving themselves some credit. Now, I am not in any way, shape, or form saying this is what this pastor believes because I don't know. So I'm not going to give the name or anything like that because this is not an attack upon their theology or an attack upon them. It's just, I want you to hear what I heard. And, and, and you can tell me if you hear the same thing. Maybe maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe when I play it here now, I'm going to be like, well, nope, never mind. Let's all just move on. But, you can, but I at least want to bring this subject up. Who deserves the credit? Because I get lots of questions sometimes about Arminianism or Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism or, or you know, I don't understand why, you know, you seem to hold to that Calvinistic reform thing. It doesn't make any sense. And it just really comes down to, okay, let's, let's set aside all of those labels. Let's set aside all of those categories. Let me just ask you, who deserves the credit for your salvation? Who? Now, if you say, well, I mean, God did his part, but I did my part. Well, it sounds like you're trying to take some credit. Now, you may think it's perfectly okay to take some credit. I, I, I have a, a number of problems with that. But let's listen to this together. I'm not, gonna, I'm not reviewing the whole sermon. He spent 12 minutes. It, it's kind of weird. He spent 12 minutes talking about a lot of things. And then all of a sudden, it, like the 12-minute mark, then he prays. Then he's like, okay, like here. So I don't know. I don't know what the 12, the 12 minutes first. I don't quite know. I, I guess it's, I don't even, I guess it was kind of the introduction. I, I don't really know. Then he prays. Then he goes into the sermon. And uh, well, basically his, his thesis is this. You better be right. You better be right. Whatever you believe, you better be right. Because if you're wrong, then, then bad things are going to happen. So you better be right. Okay, that we could talk about that thesis. We there's a lot. There, there's some scripture he brought up that we could spend a lot of time doing, basically a Bible study exercise on. But I just he's going to kind of transition in here, kind of talking about salvation, talking about atheists, and then he's going to kind of start talking, kind of giving a little bit of his testimony, and just who who seems to be getting the credit for the salvation. I just want you to. I mean, I just want you to hear this again, not even really about this preacher. It's, it's not even about that. It's, this is just a common thing that happens within American evangelicalism because American evangelicalism has been greatly influenced by, I think, a synergistic theology of salvation. It's been very in, influenced by an Arminian, semi-Pelagian view. It's just, it's the dominant view uh, and Whenever you mention some of the theological terms, like if I mention Calvinism or Pelagianism or Arminianism, everyone loses their minds. They go crazy. But sometimes I think it's good. Just let's set all of that aside. Let's just listen. And you, you, you tell me what you hear. You may hear something completely different than what I've heard. You may, you may not even think it's an issue, but that's okay. I, I, you know, I love, I love sharing what I'm listening to. I do. I love just, I love listening to sermons and talking about them. I love listening to Christian podcasts and talking about them. So that's what I'm here in an empty sanctuary. I've got a little bit of time. So let's talk about what I listened to today on the way to get my hair cut. And then when I got back in the car, I started listening to it again. And uh, well, let's just see. Let's see what we hear. Here we go. The prayer just ended. Now he's going to come in. He's loud. Um, I had, this is the one time I had to turn the volume down. Uh, it was way too loud, but it's still probably going to be a little loud, but, um, that I'd rather it be too loud than, uh, 
then not loud enough, just so that you're, if you're wearing headphones, just be prepared. Here we go. Amen. All right. So, you know, like I say, I talked to a lot of different people. I mentioned a guy in, uh, in uh, upstate New York, and I said, what God, that, look at, this is what, I give me, give me something to read about what God did for me. And he said, what God ever done for me? Amen. Well, that's one, one example uh, of a response in an effort to try to tell somebody about the Lord. Uh, but I've run into people say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. They just say that. And okay. I mean, they, people got that right. I get that. But I just say this. If you don't believe there's a God, you better be right. You better be right. But I want to tell you some scripture. The Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible says in Psalm 12, verse 15, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Let me give you some counsel. Let me give you some wise, wise counsel. If you're living like there's no good, no God, you better be right. But I'm here to tell you, you're not right. You're wrong. You're deceived. Uh, amen. There, there, there definitely is a God. Uh, you're not right. You're dead wrong. Creation itself declares the glory of God. Maybe you don't get out much, but I do. And I've seen sunsets, and I've seen sunrises, and I've seen, I mean, look at the faith of a child. I'm a grandpa, so I'm prejudiced. Amen. There's no, where did that come from? Amen. I, I did a, uh, uh, a meeting with a medical. Now, let me just stop right here. This, this begins to kind of give maybe the basic concept of what's going on here. But there's the, there's, again, there's these two schools of thought, right? Salvation is all the work of God, or it's God's done his part, and you've got to do your part. And, and those who believe you have to do your part, they, they would carry, they would speak of it in terms like this, like, okay, look, look, the, the evidence is right in front of you. There's no excuse. You, 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 you think you're right, but you better be right. But I'm telling you, you're wrong. So here you go. I, I don't know how you can't see it. It's right there in front of you. Just believe it. It's just right there. You should be able to figure it out. Almost with the concept that you do have the ability to figure it out. That you can see it. That you can figure it out. Now, the minute you seem to impose the idea that, hey, it's right there in front of you. Just see it and believe it. You can do it. The minute you say they can, and then... They don't, you are inadvertently, even though you may not be trying, you're, you're seemingly to say, I was smart enough to see it. I was smart enough to figure it out. You're not, I am. You're the fool, I'm not the fool. You're not smart enough, I was smart enough. That almost is the end, I mean, it's inevitable that almost becomes the, the theology. Now, they would try to say, no, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. You can't have it both ways. If you say people have the ability to see, figure it out and believe and if they and if they exercise quote unquote their will not to believe, not to receive, but you did, well then that means you figured it out. You're smarter than they are. You you're you're somehow more spiritual than they are. And you say, "Well, no, no, no. God, well, okay, now the minute you say God, you bring God into it. Well, then if God did that for you, why didn't God do that for them?" And then you walk yourself right into these theological issues that have divided the church for 2,000 years. And you get into the discussion about Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, Calvinism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do people have the ability or do they not have the ability? If they have the ability and don't, why do some understand, figure it out, and believe, and others don't? Well, it's either it's all because of just something and someone or you're going to bring in God into it. You bring in God into it. You bring up, bring up all kinds of very important theological concepts. But just, you already kind of hear a little bit of where he's going, but just stay with it. Here we go. Medical doctor, I mean, 25, 26 years ago, it was a big youth rally, all day thing. And this guy, they had me give my testimony to prove that God can save the, 
you know, the gutter most. But then this guy comes in, and he's a medical doctor, and he is a surgeon and, and everything. And he got up there with a PowerPoint. It wasn't really. It was an overhead projector. Remember them? And uh, he had a, and he was drawing out and, and, and systems within the body. And he, and he said, anybody that, 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 that thinks that all this, and he's going through the nervous system and the circulatory system and the muscular system and the skeletal system, and he's going through all that stuff, and he says, anybody that even can slightly, remotely comprehend what's going, in, going on inside of a human being and then say that there was not a divine architect is a fool. Amen. All right, they're full. See, you, you see where this kind of where this is going to lead. If you if you can look into the human body and you see all these things and you don't understand, there's a divine designer. You are a fool. Amen. Amen. They're fools. We're not. Amen. They don't get it, but we did. They're fools. We're not. You, you see that? You see there where this is going? This is where, they're, 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 look, theology always has consequences and implications that are practical. Sometimes people don't think theology is very practical. Oh, that's just that stuff you talk about in seminary. And it, No, this has practical implications. And, and, and in many cases, this has very much to do with where you're going to end up spiritually as far as humility or pride is concerned. And this doctor got up there and he showed all of these systems, right? He showed all of these systems and he's like, look, if you can't see, if you look at this and you can't see that there's a divine designer, you're a fool. And you can hear the people in the background. Amen. That's right. They're fools. They're fools. And all of you aren't. Now, what makes you different than them? What makes you different than them? Because you're not foolish and they're foolish. It's the difference because you're smarter than them? Is, is that the difference? Th th to me, this has major implications. But let's just, let's see where he's going to go here. I think you're going to get the idea. And, and buddy, it didn't just happen. Amen. I'm here to tell you, if you're living like there's no God, you don't believe in God, you better be right. But I'm here to tell you, you're not right. I've run into people that said, I don't believe in hell. The, the, if you're living like there is no hell, <laughs> you better be right. Yeah, but you're not. You're not right. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Look with me in verse 19. Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, the Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22 said, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into the Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was Buried. Two guys as different as night and day. But they had something in common, didn't they? The Bible said, and as it is appointed unto man once to die. And, then, and after this, the judgment. Everybody in here has got an appointment. Two appointments. Two appointments they won't be late for. For some people, it'll be the first appointments they're not late for. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, but he's got an appointment with death. Amos said, prepare to meet thy God. And I'm here to tell you tonight. I'm here. Okay, someone just asked, is the Luke 16 a, a parable? Well, there's lots of debate here, lots of discussions. Here's what I would say. Um, there's a, lot, a lot of people go back and forth. Here's, here's what I would say. If we say it's a parable, then it's a parable pointing at spiritual realities. So some people say it's a parable, which then they, they use to try to dismiss the reality of hell. But if it's a parable, it's pointing to spiritual realities. It's pointing to something that's true and real. It's like we talked about uh, John chapter 13, 
Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, that many view that as a parable. That doesn't take away the historical reality of what Jesus was doing, but we believe it's pointing to a deeper and more, a, a greater spiritual reality because it points to the incarnation of Jesus Christ taking upon human flesh, his death, burial, resurrection, and ultimate ascension to retor- return to the glory that he had before he came to earth. So if this is a parable, it's pointing to, to in other words, it's using, here's two individuals, Maybe the individuals were real, maybe they were not, but here's what happened to them, and that points to us to the to greater spiritual realities of basically that there is something after this life which is either a heaven or a place of eternal suffering, All right? So just, that's as much as we can get into for now, but yeah, there, there's that back and forth on whether that's a parable to me. I, Call it a parable. It doesn't matter to me as long as we acknowledge that there is a spiritual reality it's pointing to, and that spiritual reality is very, 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 very real. That That's the main point I would try to uh, take from that. All right, here we go. The authority of the Word of God, Spirit of God bearing witness to it, you're going to meet God. You're going to meet your Maker. Now, whether you meet Him as Savior or Judge, that's up to you. But I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to meet him as judge because you're going to end up in hell. Okay, so you, you now here now we're getting really close to where he's going. Now, I do think it's interesting he picks a parable and there's two men. Now, what's the difference between the two men? Now, he just said you're either going to meet God as judge or savior and that's up to you. You. So that means you determine if you're going to meet God as judge or savior. You. It's up to you. Now, again, this means you get some of the credit. You get to meet God as savior. The other person you know gets to meet God as judge. And the reason you get to meet God as savior is because you figured it out. You were smart. You didn't deny the, the evidence. You Maybe you were just fortunate, right? There are some people born in parts of the world where they may never even hear the name of Jesus. So uh, they, they, you know, you, you were given the opportunities and others don't. But, but I guess, it, does, God, does God come into play there? Or maybe God had nothing to do with that, right? So does God get cre- credit? If you say, well, well, God gets the credit for that. Well, why didn't he do that for someone else? I mean, you, these ra- this raises very important theological Issues that make people very uncomfortable, but we shouldn't be uncomfortable with it. We have to just acknowledge it. He just made a a dogmatic claim. Hey, it's up to you. It's up to you. So you can either be a fool who denies the reality and denies all of the evidence, or you can be smart and figure it out. And then you can say, I'm patting myself on the back. You can't see. Look at me. I figured it out. Let, let, let's continue. Let's see, let's see if, if this theme continues. And you don't want to be in hell. These two people, as different as they were, had those two things in common. Look at verse 23. And in hell, the rich man, there was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And see if Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. That rich man, the Bible says he went to hell. Amen. Remember hearing that as a kid? I remember that. I tell you what I chose to believe, though. I chose to believe some stupid movie. I chose to believe some rock singers that, that, that made it a party down there. There ain't no party going on down there according to the Bible. Now, you can believe anything you want, but I'm obligated. My duty is to tell you the truth, not my opinion. I'll be the first to acknowledge your opinion's worth every bit as much as mine. So that's why we're not talking about my opinion versus yours. Where I'm opening the Bible, I'm going to tell you what God's opinion says. Now you do with it what you want. Okay, now I do. I, I know this is very typical Christian language. Hey, you have an opinion. I have an opinion. Our opinions don't mean anything. However, you're listening to me because I'm opening up God's word and I'm giving you God's opinion. No, okay. Let, let's let's make sure we let's let's be at least honest here. You're opening up God's word, giving me your interpretation of God's word. So there's still a little bit of you. And it's almost like preachers have a tendency to do that. You have an opinion. I have an opinion. None of our opinion matters. But I'm going to preach a sermon. And what I say is true. And it's not my opinion. But you're giving me your interpretation of the text. So I I think 
sometimes as Christians, we, we have this weird like, okay, everyone in the world has opinions. We've got facts. Now, I do believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, but we at least have to be intellectually honest to say, well, it's our interpretation of God's word. It's our interpretation of God's word. Now, I, I think we have to do everything we can to ensure that we are interpreting it correctly, that we're doing, we're using all the correct means of interpretation. And I, I do believe we can find truth that way, but we just, we have to at least always acknowledge that whenever I look at someone, I'm like, no, God's word says this. We have to stop and go, wait a minute. That's what you think God's word says. That's your interpretation of it. Now, we still have to be dogmatic about what we believe God's word says. I'm not in any way calling for some relativistic nonsense, but I'm just saying there has to be at least a little bit of acknowledgement that we're, we're clearly involved in the preaching process and the biblical interpretation. We're involved. And our interpretations are not infallible. Our interpretations are not magisterial authority being handed down, you know, from, from Rome. It's no, it's I study God's word and then I do my best to preach and teach and explain what the text says using hopefully good Bible study techniques, good observational techniques, which lead to good interpret interpretational techniques so that we can figure out the truth. But it's just, it's just Christians are really good. At, you, the world has opinions. We have facts. And here's the facts. And then they give you their interpretation of a text. And I'm like, and, and is that infallible? The text is infallible. All right. The text is infallible. The text is true. But once we start trying to figure it out, things can get a little a, a, a little muddy? Can we at least be honest with that? I know I'm not supposed to say these things. I know I'm not supposed to say these things and Christians get mad at me, but come on, let's just be honest. But okay, I'm still wanting to, I'm still wanting to see where he's going to go with this idea of who gets credit for salvation. Just, he's getting ready here in a minute. He's just, he's going to be like making these points and then boom, he's going to deviate and start telling his story. He's going to start telling his story and just kind of see how it, where it goes. But if you're living like there's no hell, you better be right. And I got bad news for you. You're not right. First time I ever saw that passage, first time I ever heard it preached, I was in a county jail looking at over 30 years in federal prison. Amen. I was in the hole for starting a riot, and, uh, and uh, they put me in solitary, wouldn't let me out, said I was a menace to the other prisoners. I thought that was a compliment. I tell you what, that got old. Being in solitary confinement got old after about a week, and uh, I put in a note, and I said, Spurgeon request to go anywhere. And after another week, they came and, and opened the door and said, come on, you're going to church. I said, no, I ain't. I ain't going to no blankety-blank church. I did. And uh, they said, your name's on the list. He had a clipboard. And, uh, and he said, you're going to church. And the guy in the next cell, which was also solitary, which he was a murderer, my only friend, killed his wife with a hammer for cheating on him. I didn't know that against him. Anyway, and uh, he said, uh, he said uh, what he got to lose? And I tell you what, common sense prevailed. I went, yeah, what do I got to lose? At least I get out of the cell. And uh, I've said it before here, my reluctance uh, to go into that church of wasn't because I didn't believe in God. I just didn't believe God had have anything to do with me. And I wasn't running to God because I was in trouble. I was way past that. I wasn't a kid. So I go down there, and the preacher looks around, and, and, and he opens the Bible in Luke 16, and he preaches on hell. I said, oh, that's cheerful. And then he says, you die in your sin, you're going there. I went, oh, that's, I didn't like him. I didn't like his haircut. I didn't like his suit. I didn't like his Bible. I sure didn't like his message. I didn't believe what he said. Amen? But I'm going to tell you what. It came to me. I realized it a little later. It took me a couple weeks. That book said in John chapter 8, verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Please note how he said this. I didn't realize it then, but then I realized it. It took me a couple of weeks. It took me. Like he's, all of the emphasis is on he figured it out. He's the one who figured it out. So he's the one who's ultimately going to get credit 
And the and it, now this person, if we I don't know if, if we were to corner this pastor and ask him, maybe theologically he would be like, no, God deserves all the praise, God deserves all the credit, God deserves all the glory. So many times we say one thing theologically, and then we turn around and deny our very theology, many cases, and how we speak because we're not we're not very precise in our language. But here he's getting ready, he's telling the story that like you know he didn't like anything, but then he figures it out and the, and well he's going to explain how I guess he figured it out. Here we go. Freedom's a big deal. I'm American. Amen. Freedom's a big deal. I served. I, I, I've defended freedom. It means something to me. And I was anything but free. And in that place where I was locked up and if the government had your way, I'd have been locked up the rest of my life most likely. In that place, I was not only acutely aware that I was not free to come and go as I pleased. According to what this preacher said, I was going to be bound and cast into a lake of fire. I went, oh, great, this is getting worse by the minute. But I'll tell you what, I sure appreciate somebody having the guts to tell me the truth. Now, I, didn't, he, I didn't believe it, but he believed it. And that caused me to think about it. And a seed was sown. And I, here's what I came with. If what he says is true, if what he showed me from the Bible is true, I'd be a fool not to get saved. See, he, this is what he came with. He, 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 he. It's all about him. He figured it out. He figured it out. Now, I don't want you to, I don't want you to think in any way, shape, or form that I'm calling this pastor's salvation into question. I'm not. I'm seeing that this is a, this is just the, the common way of theology in much of the American church. It's, it's very man-centered, and salvation is very much seen from a semi-Pelagian, Arminian perspective where it's us, 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 us. Now, I know in Arminianism, you have prevenient grace, and we could get into a whole theological discussion, but it becomes about us. I, I, I figured it out. I, I bet you if I went back and if there were audio of when, because I was, I mean, I, I'd only been saved. I mean, I got saved. I mean, the night I got saved, literally the night that I became a Christian, that God saved me, um, literally I was placed behind the pulpit that night. I mean, literally that, like, I, 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 I'm in the pew weeping, realizing I'm a sinner. I come forward and literally within minutes, I, they put me behind the pulpit. I mean, it was, it was just a crazy situation. And it was not long after that, weeks, months, I was, I was now being placed behind pulpits to give, quote unquote, my testimony. And I was taken from church to church to church around different parts of West Texas to give my testimony. And I guarantee you that I, I, I mean, I, well, I cannot guarantee you completely, but I am pretty sure that my, that there was a lot of emphasis on me, 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 not on God. And one of the things, because a lot of times in testimony, it all becomes about you, right? You tell all of the, 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 the gory stories of your past, and they want you to tell all the bad ones. And the emotional ones, I want you to tell how bad it was, how bad, it's almost like you're, you're telling about the, you know, the good old days, and then you talk about God saving you, and then you talk about you, 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 how you're different, 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 and it, it really just becomes a, a whole story about you, and God is just kind of thrown in. And, and I know people would argue that's, that's not how testimonies work, but it's really very self-centered in many, in many cases. And it becomes about us instead of about God. And I just, like, this is really going to become about him and him figuring it out. Let, let's see if he says anything else. Say, but did you believe it? I didn't know what to believe, but I know this. If hell's real, it said there, it said, uh, uh, tormented in this flame. In hell, he, uh, yeah, in hell he lifted up his eyes being turned. If that's so, I don't want a part of it. I was a tough guy. I was an infantryman and a paratrooper. I was a, a, a martial arts, pistolero, gang member. I thought I... Man, this guy had done a lot, <laughs> okay? This guy was an infantryman. He was a paratrooper. He was in a gang. <laughs> he, was, he was in martial arts. Clearly, he was in prison. Uh, he was in solitary confinement. He'd started a riot in prison. I mean, this man's got a story, okay? <laughs> this, this man's got a crazy, crazy... Uh, in fact, we, we, we want to just look up his story and they need to make a movie about it. I mean, a paratrooper, infantryman, <laughs> okay? Martial arts, gang member, <laughs> okay? I mean... Ooh. That, that, that's a lot. He's got a lot going on, but he was tough. He was tough. He was tough. All right, here we go. A tough guy. See, all you see is old fat grandpa. 
That's 30 years ago. But I tell you what, I had enough, I had enough uh, 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 honesty within my own self to admit I wasn't tough. If that book's true, I wasn't tough enough for hell. See, I, I, I had enough honesty in myself. I, 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 I figured it out. I saw, I, I, it's about him. He figured it out. Then the other people who don't, you just don't have enough honesty with yourself. You're just foolish. You're just dumb. You just don't get it. This is, and, and, and it, you cannot tell me it does not lead to a little bit of spiritual pride. Now, let me be very, 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 very fair. We got to be very fair here. I, obviously, for those who are, who are far more into the Pelagian side, semi-Pelagian, Arminian side, you're going to take great offense to that. But let me just be honest. Those on the more reformed side who would say salvation is all the work of God and God deserves all the glory and deserves all the honor. Well, in many cases in the reform side, it becomes about all of our knowledge about reform theology. And we know Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism and Arminianism. We know who Jacob Arminius was and we know who Pelagius was. And we know, we know who Augustine was and we know all of this and we know this doctrine and this theology. And the next thing we know, we replace pride about our salvation with pride about our spiritual knowledge. And then spiritual knowledge becomes the source of pride because the reality is because of our sin and depravity that stays with us. Even after we're saved, we find anything and everything to become arrogant and proud about as Christians. We become arrogant and proud about our morality. We become arrogant and proud about our salvation. We become arrogant and proud about our theology. We become arrogant and proud about pretty much anything and everything. And so many cases, we just now take our entire Christianity and Christianity just now becomes a robe of self-righteous arrogance where we're condescending and condemning of everyone around us. That is typical. That happens to all of us. And it's something that we have to look at. But, but it just, I want you to hear that. I, 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 it's all about him. He figured it out. He figured it out. Amen. If you if you believe there's no God, you better be right. You're not. You're wrong, and you got an appointment with Him. If you're living like there's no hell, uh, you better be right. But uh, but you're not. You're not. <laughs> Amen. And don't find out the hard way. Occasionally, I hear about people that that claim to be saved, and and may even truly be born again. Because if you're not in that Bible, and if you're not in church, and if you're not around others that'll provoke you unto love and unto good works, you can fall for just about anything. I've seen that through the years. And so I've run into and heard about some people recently, and and, and they, they say they're saved, and they like all that heaven stuff, and all that love, and all that, but they don't believe there's a hell. We call them no hellers. Okay, now he's going to go into a long thing about people who don't believe in hell and basically how foolish they are and how wrong they are, okay, and all of that type of thing. Okay, fine. I, 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 I could play more if, if you want to look it up. Uh, it's on Sermon Audio 2.0, the app. Just do a search for You Better Be Right. By all means, listen to it. And again, there's, I have no desire to attack or anything along those lines because – there's nothing here that's like, ooh, I can't believe he said this because this is a very common approach. And and I'm approaching it from a completely, I'm assuming, from a very different theological perspective. Now, maybe he holds to this a similar theological perspective that I hold to, and he just it just happened that he preached it in a way that he used language that wasn't theologically precise. It's possible. I'll go back and listen to some of my sermons and be like, what in the world? Why did I say it that way? That was dumb, 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 dumb. So we... Preachers make mistakes all the time. So it, it's not about bashing him in any way, shape, or form. It's the concept. So let me ask you again, who gets the credit for salvation? And I'm just going to look at two very important verses, all right? And both of these you probably know. First is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I just wanted to share this with you because it's what I was listening to today. And well, I like I like to be very real when I sit here in front of the microphone and if it's something I was interested in, something that I've been thinking about, then why just ignore that and go to something else? Let's well talk about what I've been thinking about and then you can give me your thoughts and opinions on it. But John chapter 6, as I was driving the car, this is what I was thinking about. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I think it's very important. 
Um, let's see, where, what verse? All right, here we go. John chapter 6, verse 65. Jesus is speaking. And he said, speaking of Jesus, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. No one comes to Jesus unless the father has given it, unless the father has determined it, unless the father grants it, chose it, determined it, predetermined it. We could even go, if we want to go even to eternity past, but you do not get saved unless God grants you that salvation, gives you that salvation. Everyone quotes this verse, this this verse, everyone loves this verse. But so many times people who quote it, I'm like, are you sure you believe that? Because they they, they quote it like they believe it, but then I'm not so sure. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. The grace and faith isn't of you from you. It is a gift. God has to grant you the faith. God has to grant you the faith. He has to open your eyes because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. He has to regenerate you. He has to give you the faith. He has to change your mind about the things of God and about Christ. There, God has to do the work. It's all a work of God. He has to spiritually grant you life. He has to give you faith. He has to turn you to him. It's not of you. Either you're, either you believe that or you believe it's because you figured it out. You were smarter and, and, not, and therefore you're claiming to be, you're, well, you're synergistic. Okay. Someone just said, so must we still accept it or is it forced? Okay. It's not about a, ma- okay. That's a good question. Very good question. Think of it this way. We accept it, but we're accepting it because God has given us the desire to accept it. In other words, my acceptance is a work of God. My faith is a work of God. My turning to him, it's all God. God is the one doing it. I'm believing because of him. I'm accepting because of him. I would not, a dead person can't accept anything. God has to grant me the life so that, and then really grant me the desire to accept. Grant me the faith. He has to do it all. Now, he makes me willing Right? So God changes everything. He changes the desire. He changes the mindset. He changes everything. And if he doesn't, well, then a person will not become saved because in their natural desire, they don't. Let me see if I can find it. A famous quote from Augustine. Let me see. Let me see if I can find it. I don't have the source for it, but I believe I have it written down. Yes. To will, to will, in other words, to have a will to desire something is of nature. We naturally have a will and desire. But to will aright is of grace. In other words, it's only of God's grace that I will will to believe. It's only by God's grace that I can believe. It's only by God's grace that I would desire to believe. It's only by God's grace that I would accept. It's all of God. It's all of God. God, if he doesn't, we don't. If he doesn't give me the faith, I don't believe. He doesn't give me the grace, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do anything because I'm dead. Again, I I use the illustration all the time. I, I drive, every time I drive to this church and I drive back home, I drive right past the cemetery. It's right there. Little small cemetery in the middle of nowhere, West Texas. Right. Looks like something from a uh, if you've ever watched a a Western, it looks like something from that. Right. Um, And it's just right there. I can pull into that cemetery and I can I can I can yell, I can threaten, I can offer and nobody can do anything because they're all dead. And that's the same true of every sinner. We're all dead. So if you decide to believe it's not because you figured it out. It's not because you are smarter. It's because God opened your eyes. God regenerated you. God granted you the faith. God is the one who saved you. It's all a work of God. Now, do we call that a forced salvation? Well, I guess you, I guess you, I I think the word implies something negative. It implies something negative where, 
it's not like we get saved and like, man, I didn't want to be saved and I hate this. I don't think it turns out because God changes the desire. He changes that so that it it's not it doesn't feel as something forced. It's we feel something we are grateful that God saved us. I think is the right way to understand that. Now I know that's just scratches the surface of all of the theological issues that that raises, and that raises a million theological questions that obviously I can't answer right here in this podcast episode. But I will can point you to something. Um, all of our series on the Book of Romans. I mean, basically, especially everything in Romans eight, everything in Romans eight. If you can find, uh, if you go to the Church One app and uh, go to series, you'll see our series on Romans, and you can just start listening. I mean, especially once I get to chapter eight, and I, I keep adding new sermons. Almost, I'm trying to add about two sermons per day from Romans to the Church One app. So and and placing them in the right series. So if you'll just if you have your notifications on, you'll see new sermons being added to Romans constantly and you can see the titles but if uh, basically we get into all of the the deeper issues Pelagianism Arminianism in fact just Sunday we finished looking up at the order of God's decrees um, you know Emerald D in view the uh, the uh, su- supra lapsarianism and infra lapsarianism we went into all of those things um, on Sunday but that's all in our series on Romans you can listen to that and we'll go deeper but I just wanted you to hear basically it comes down to this I'll just simplify it Either you're going to take some credit or God gets all the credit. And if you take some of the credit, well, you can do that. I think you to do that, theologically, you're going to have to deny that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You're going to have to deny total depravity, which means you're going to end up as a semi-Pelagian or full-blown Pelagian, which then is heretical. <laughs> okay, that's just a heretical perspective, and I don't think it's biblical. So, um, and if if you don't and 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 if you don't take any of the credit, well then you end up well believing that it's all a work of God. And I believe the scriptural language it's a work of God. No one comes to the Father unless it's another. No one comes to the Son unless it's given to them by the Father. The Father has to do that. The Father has to approve it. The Father has to give it. He has to give. Faith is a gift. He has to give you the faith to believe. You can't, it's not like you just have the ability to develop that faith in and of yourself. No, you're dead in your trespasses and sin. Your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. You're, 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 you, you have to have God do the work. So there you have it. Now, it's now 539. So I will wrap this one up. So maybe we can get one more thing done before everyone arrived. There's lots of sermons I've listened to over the last 48 hours, 72 hours that we could, uh, so I'll have to decide, maybe, we're, maybe the next one will be the same type of thing. Because I started seeing a pattern develop. Uh, this, this sermon very much was, I figured it out kind of thing. And then there was another sermon where there's a passage of scripture they're looking at. And the passage of scripture literally says, God does it. And then the whole sermon turned into, you better do this and you better do this and you better do that. And I'm like, wait a minute, the text said God did the work and you're saying now I have to do it. What just happened? There's a lot of that in in preaching where we forget the actual work of God and we make it the work of man. Something to consider, all right? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, someone, Someone else just said that it was helpful. I hope it was, I hope it. I know, now I feel like, man, I need to go into a full blown teaching on semi-Pelagianism, Pelagianism, Arminianism, uh, Reformed theology, Calvinism. Go, but um, hopefully you just get the basic concept. Um, it, it's God. It's God. It's God who does the work. It's God. It's God. That, look, put it this way. There are a million issues theologically that you may never able to get wrapped around in your brain. You may never ever, ever be able to understand it. It may always be feel like it's too complicated. But always end up it always end up here. Salvation is a work of God alone. God gives you the faith. He ch- opens your eyes. He regenerates you. And, and we, we could get into the order, order salutis, the order, order of salvation, how it works. Um, and that, that could, um, okay. 
So, uh, well, a lot of people are saying I should do that. Just remember, though, a lot of this teaching has been done in our series on Romans. So, it's just, so before I, I, I do it again, just make sure everyone knows it is there in the Romans series. So uh, the Church One app will be the easiest way to find it all. Um, and I'll just, I'll start, work, I'll just start trying to upload as fast as I can everything from Romans 8. Um, because if I can get it all uploaded, then I think there, because I had someone just the other day email me something about Arminianism. I'm like, it's, it's in the Roman series. It's in the Roman series. So um, uh, maybe maybe I can gu- guide there. And then then people can listen to that and, and go, well, I still have a question. And then I can then I can take the questions from the Roman series and then just answer the questions. And then, and then I think that would work instead of doing it again. But if I need to do it again, I will. All right, I'm going to get everything ready. All right, cool. Someone said yes, they're listening to it now. All right, good. That's awesome. All right. Hopefully that was beneficial. Hopefully that was helpful. And uh, I will uh, I'll stop there for now. And I'm just looking around to see what I want to do next. There's, uh, I, I, see, I didn't know I was going to be here today. I, I thought I was just going to be here for the 7 o'clock service. So I, I caught, was caught completely off guard. And once that w- opportunity happened, I'm like, boom, pack everything, drive to the church, and let's let's go. Let's go. So we're going to try to make the most of the next uh, about hour. So I'll be back on the air here shortly. If you're using the Church One app, you'll just have your notifications on and you'll know when I go live. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, God bless.